Hello, this is Voyager Time. Kim Tasli Farwa Wildres Wilden Wordare Fear Gif Schweitzer was Breme Blawed Wide Sprung and possessed by the spirit of inquiry and bloodlust. I'm Andrew, when with me today is Sarah. Ben. And I'm someone who wished to sack the Nutcastle. <laughs> today we're talking about Voyager episode eleven on Netflix, Heroes and Demons. The holographic doctor must rescue crew members who were turned into light energy in a holodeck simulation of Beowulf. The Voyager has fired two of its 38 photon torpedoes. Also, I'm Nathan. So that was from Beowulf, what you read at the beginning? That was indeed a little segment of Beowulf in the Old English. So Um, there was no way we could have ever potentially guessed that quote. Absolutely not. Believe it or not, that was my exact guess of what the (laughs) quote was going to be. You know, I should have known better, Nate. (laughs) <laughs> translated it is ruler of glory granted honor on earth schweitzer was famed his renown spread wide <laughs> and possessed by the spirit of inquiry and bloodlust schweitzer's an actual character in beowulf no 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 i replaced beowulf's name oh okay i was <laughs> okay. like <laughs> <laughs> i see, i don't know that would have been an appropriate thing to fill in for his name though since he was told to research beowulf uh, I learned that Albert Schweitzer was a real doctor, uh, and the mm-hmm. writer th- of this episode, mm-hmm. Naren Shankar, picked it because it sounded funny. <laughs> sounded Perfect. funny. He thought it I sounded know, funny. As we were watching okay. it, Allison was giving me his, his bio. Oh, really? <laughs> God. We need to have a guest, guest spot yeah. from Allison to have a Schweitzer <laughs> info dump for us. <laughs> All right, I'll go get it. <laughs> I mean, I did find it amusing when at the banquet all the Vikings were chanting his name. Yeah, it was very. That good. was a lot of fun. I like how they immediately switched over to Lord Schweitzer from when he introduced <laughs> himself as Doctor Schweitzer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was this was good. It was light. Um, not a lot happened here. I, I anytime we get to see the Doctor do anything, I'm real happy about it. I was yeah. very happy to get in a uh, quote unquote away mission for the Doctor. It was a really like that cool they way to do it. sorted they sorted that piece out. I'm generally not a huge fan of like the melodrama episodes in the mm-hmm. holodeck personally, but maybe yeah. I just haven't seen the good ones yet. <laughs> no, they're annoying. <laughs> yeah, it just it it feels like I don't know. Manufactured. Yeah. And then, like, the melodrama of, like, the overacting of the people in the quote-unquote book or whatever, like, yeah, it really stands out compared to, <laughs> comparatively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was great watching Tuvok just do the Tuvokery compared to those guys who were just, yeah, mm-hmm. overacting the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was very silly and a lot of fun, just that, like, contrast at the beginning. I mm-hmm. thought it was going to be about Chakotay and Tuvok trying to figure it out at the beginning and got Me totally too. Yeah, this episode totally had baited. several false starts because like at the beginning, it's like Janeway and Torres doing some science stuff. And so I'm like, great, we're going to have another boring techno babble episode. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, then, and then Harry got went missing and then Chakotay and Tuvok go and investigate the holodeck because they can't figure out what happened to him. And then I was th- I thought it was going to be about them too. And then that was the false start because then they also got they got disappeared. And then it turned out it was going to be about the doctor, which I'm not complaining because I love him. Yeah, but- he's great. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about the start for just a, a minute there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. The sh- where Balana and Janeway are, are whatever doing science stuff. There was this kind of overhead shot. And it was really weird because there's like a carpet and a rug in engineering and it just made it feel like they're in a room and not on a starship. And I was realizing going through that it's because you can see their feet. Like when you can see just people at their post and their feet, the whole thing looks like a set. <laughs> yeah, I, it's a weird choice for them to choose that shot when it's like the set designers didn't think about the floor mm-hmm. at all because it's not normally shown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they just have wall to wall in engineering. I must not have been paying attention because I don't remember that shot, but I believe you. I, it probably just like went in one in one eye and out the other, just not paying attention <laughs> at all. I'm going to have to consult the books on that one. See if <laughs> that is, the that is a, 
That is accurate on what, how eyes work, Nate. I, that's what okay. Dr. Albert Schweitzer proved. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't quote me on that though. I would like to point out that uh Janeway and Torres both were going to fully take advantage of Ensign Harry Kim at oh, this yeah. beginning because oh, yeah. they were like, we want this to be done faster than in six hours. Hmm, who has uh, nothing better to do? Yeah. who? Who's, <laughs> let's see if Vincent Kim's busy and he's so they're like, isn't he on free time or whatever? And they're like, I'm sure we can get him to help us. And it's like. <laughs> Yeah, he's gonna say yes. It's the captain asking him to do this, uh-huh. so it's the he captain can't say and no. Chief engineer. <laughs> yeah, he can't say no to that. But it kind of sucks. Like free time mm-hmm. should be free time, and there's really no one else on the ship that can help. Yeah, what about like, Carrie? No one. What about like literally anybody in engineering? There are other people around them. Uh-huh. Like they're not all doing something that's vitally important. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe they are. I don't know. I'm just saying you shouldn't take advantage of the ensign who's like trying to prove himself. Uh huh. He wants to read his stories, his 1500 year old book. It didn't end up mattering because he was missing anyway, and he had like one line in the whole episode. <laughs> so he yeah. got a week off regardless. But yep, right. He looked pretty good in that armor, I thought. Yeah, so yeah. it's such a shame that Tom didn't get to see him wearing it. I know. I know. He was Tom, so panicked. Was very he was concerned about Tom was where... very upset. <laughs> was I was I was upset they stopped. didn't have a scene together, but they oh, Tom was very, good. very concerned about Harry mm-hmm. being missing, and so he was like leading the charge and finding them and getting mm-hmm. his boyfriend back. It sounded like there was genuine panic in his voice. Mm-hmm. There was. It was I mean, real. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that it was he like... loves him. Yeah, the fact that it's like, what about Harry and the others? Like, yeah, exactly. His friends yeah. Tuvok and Chikoshe, who didn't the bother to name. Who are like way higher ranking people on the ship. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, Harry and the others. Relegate to the others. Uh-huh. <laughs> In real life scenario. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I really enjoyed Tuvok showing up there and they run into this woman, Freya, right away. And his first reaction is just computer delete character. <laughs> that was the best what moment of the episode. Move. It was <laughs> excellent. Well, I mean, that's what is logical to do in that situation. They're in the I holodeck. Know. They yeah. don't want to deal with this. But again, just the, that contrast of this like dramatic entrance of this folk character. and I am the shield <laughs> maiden Freya, delete. and I have slain thousands of men. Computer delete character. Yeah. It was it was silly. It was very good. Just totally pulled the rug out from under her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, she didn't even care. She didn't know what that meant. So she right. just didn't even react. Yeah, it was a little uh, Westworldy, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. What I don't understand and have never understood about the holodeck is the fact that there are safety protocols that can be disabled. Yeah. Why does that exist? Right. <laughs> there should be, I mean, if you want to do something that's like slightly more dangerous where you could like fall and hurt yourself or something, then okay, that should be allowed, I guess. But, like close Klingons like to fight and like whatever. They had that in Next Generation. There but, should like, be some, some wiggle room there. You like, shouldn't be able to die from it. No. Like that should yeah. not be a thing that's allowed to happen in the holodeck, no, no matter what settings you have. Mm-mm. It's just bad user experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a reason why you need it, but uh, I just can't. Because <laughs> there ain't one. Yeah. <laughs> I want to bring up the fact that, like, when they were when Chicote and Tuvok are talking about uh, demons and in human literature, mm-hmm. and uh, like Chicote being very eloquent about like they're like different aspects of our personality and. Uh, that's why all these heroes are like meant in the uh, X, Y, and Z ways. And then Tuvok being like, there's no demons in Vulcan literature. I had never thought about there being literature from other cultures in Star Trek, but it makes sense, obviously. And Vulcans definitely would have the worst kind because it, <laughs> it, it feels like it wouldn't have any sort of like interesting emotional stakes. <laughs> it would just be like well, it, cold it logic. It would just be logic <laughs> and puzzles and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Like, sure, it could be. It How could be will very... they use logic yeah. to get out of this one? <laughs> Is there literature just like math books? Oh, God, no. Math problems. It's the first Some half algebra. of every Sherlock Holmes book, but they don't bother 
having him solve it for you because you're supposed to be able to do that yourself. <laughs> oh, God, kill me instead. I thought you were gonna. I thought you're going down the path then of talking about you know how you know a dude eats twenty three stones to kill the stomach hate monster. <laughs> that was, was yeah. hilarious. <laughs> was like an amazing anecdote. I loved it. Is that a real story? Does anybody know? Like, is that something that was on Star Trek, man? Might have looked it, I might have looked it up if I hadn't watched the episodes literally like 20 minutes before <laughs> we started. What was the 23 stones to, <laughs> to kill, kill the hate monster? The, uh, the hate monster hate. in your stomach. That sounds like something that would be in Adventure Time. It does. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> <laughs> So the concern with Kim that they were figuring out was like he might have been like quote converted into energy like photonic the game, energy. The game ate him basically. <laughs> so they're yeah. trying to figure out like okay, well, did that happen? Where would that energy have gone? And they're finding out that this <laughs> this uh, energy that they had transported from nearby that they were playing with at the beginning of the ep- of the episode was uh, another living being, much like yeah, Coffee they should Nebula. really they should really they should start about assuming that, that that's going to be the case every time uh, for real. Uh, el- eliminate that first and then proceed. <laughs> mm-hmm. You think they would have learned that le- lesson after the first one? Can we talk about the fact that Harry was playing fucking Beowulf and not like something that he would actually be interested in, like Animorphs or something? Oh, please. Harry Kim absolutely is enough of a dork to be interested in Beowulf. (laughs) I just feel like he would be, it's just so, it's like your dad picked it out. Like, it just is not. That's totally, Harry Kim is just a, like, what, 32 year old dad. Yeah. Harry is supposed to be like 23. He's okay. like Still. just out of the academy kind of thing. This is his first mission. I remember reading Beowulf in high school and thinking that it was the most boring, bland story. I it, read it in college and thought the same. It was. I not remember good. not reading it because I was homeschooled and I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also like didn't quote unquote read it as much as like you're supposed to read to be yeah. in a school class, but I I. I read it in that I was exposed to it through the people mm-hmm. that did read it and talked about it in class. We read <laughs> maybe half of it in the original old English and then did translations with it in class, which was pretty cool. Why? Um, but the poem sucks. It is. I mean, the reason why is because it's like the Ur text for all fantasy literature. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. like it's at this point, it's. 500 years old nope scratch that 1500 years old uh, <laughs> off by a factor of three <laughs> <laughs> um it's just like it was the original like guy goes and kills a monster story mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what i don't get is why you read it in the original old english and then translated it because uh, it- old english do you want me to get into this right now do we want to talk about why do you have a short version yeah, definitely. But I mean, I don't think it's a super satisfying answer in the short version. I'll take the short, unsatisfying version. Old English is a spoken language. It wasn't really written down until much later. And so because Beowulf was an epic poem, it was passed down in a verbal tradition for quite a long time. And that means that the versions, there have been a number of versions that have been recorded. Uh, and when you read it in the original Old English, you get the musicality, the rhythm, the tone, all the sort of stuff that you lose when you just read it as text on the page. Uh, it mm-hmm. becomes much more of an experience and much less of a um, just sort of a bland fantasy poem. Yeah. I mean, it's the same argument that people use for Shakespeare, right? Yeah. That's exactly I mean, it's right. Okay. Like, yeah. you know. And Shakespeare wrote in Middle English, which is the language sort of version two of Old English. It's the mm-hmm. same sort of mm-hmm. idea that, again... It's spoken word. It's it's language as it would have been expressed by the common people, not something that was written down. Then he put his own stink on it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, Billy Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think Tom would have thought about Harry playing a Beowulf? Like, do you think he just like roasted the fuck out of him as soon as he saw him in that outfit? 
I think, yeah, they would have found some nice romantic situation afterwards, but yeah. He would have roasted him, but he definitely would have been like, oh, Harry, oh, a sweet child. Been a little. <laughs> you like, dork. Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. You adorable that dork. Outf- that outfit would definitely come back uh, in some later lovemaking for them. <laughs> you mean like right well no what happened was right after this episode he's still wearing it tom rushes oh. to his side and then oh. that's when that would happen it would right come there back. on the bridge it would just be well no <laughs> it would be in his quarters or whatever they have some decency mm-hmm. okay now hang on are you saying that this outfit he was wearing was not generated by the holodeck and that he was wearing that into the holodeck and would yeah. be able to wear that back to said quarters yes that's how it works right that is how it works and it annoys me and doesn't do make they, sense to me do they have a closet full of play costumes yes yes <laughs> that's why that's well no actually only... no they probably have the replicator make it for them which, which what doesn't a wager. what a waste of replicator power yeah well I don't know how they do it then, because that's how they did it on Next Generation, as far as I know, because they didn't have a big closet of costumes. But maybe that they have to create a big stockpile of costumes now. Wild to me. <laughs> yeah, it's just a big dress-up trunk at the foot of everyone's bed. I, like, I, I like the idea of the replicator doing it, but God, <laughs> you think? Yeah, they shouldn't. They shouldn't have introduced the idea of replicator rations earlier yeah. in the show, because now they have this. Repl- uh huh. This- problem where it's like why are you using the replicator to make yourself a beowulf costume harry i'm trying to think through this so now do they have associated programs in the replicator for particular programs in the hollow deck so like okay i'm i'm planning on going to you know run the beowulf program i'm gonna throw that code into the replicator and get my associated costume out so Probably. for every program, they have associated replicator patterns, codes. Yeah, yeah, probably. Wild. <laughs> but on Voyager, there's just a dress-up closet. Yeah, it's Neelix in the back sewing it all together. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was busy doing in this episode. Mm-hmm. He wasn't in it. Mm-hmm. Okay, such so. a nice break. That yeah, was a I really huge did thing it for me. Yeah, I was very pleased that Tom Paris was not just useless in this episode because, like, when uh, Bolana had him helping her analyze that um, the like energy being, he was actually being useful there and not just like standing in the bridge just saying saying stuff about piloting the ship. I was very pleased that he was actually helping someone for once and not just being the butt of a joke again. He was sad about Harry, too. Yeah, I mean, I expect that mm-hmm. of him, though. That's an essential role. Yeah. If he's not at least being sad for Harry or worrying about Harry, then what's the point? Right. Man, Harry's had a rough start to this whole show. <laughs> <laughs> really has like in the beginning in the very first episode he got abducted and had like his needle jabbed into his chest and then he oh, that's right. fucking he got died the lumps. and now <laughs> yeah and now he got t- transformed into an energy being or something while he was on his va- like on his break <laughs> having yeah. trying to calm down and just chill and he didn't even do anything yeah this was the equivalent of him watching tv after work like, yeah. although at this point now, I'm sure like he was seemed pretty chill about it when he was back, probably because he was sitting there thinking, "Well, at least I didn't die this time." <laughs> well, I think yeah, nothing probably, can quite be as bad. Probably it was something like he they just didn't time didn't pass for him or something. He just like blinked mm. and then everything had already happened and he was back. That's what kind of my impression was of why they did look so confused. But I guess they didn't explain it, so I don't know. <laughs> I really appreciated that every entry into the book was at the same point, like the book was stuck on repeat, like they were were going in Mm -hmm. fresh to the story, and it was their choose their own adventure, they would, you know, interact, but then they would still like circle back to some of the same dialogue in the book, Mm -hmm. with some of the characters repeating the exact same phrasing of things. Yeah. It it felt like a bad NPC loop in a video game. Yeah. Uh I was thinking like Groundhog Day time loop sort of thing. 
I mean, yeah, same, same, same concept there. So we spent all this time talking about Harry Kim and Tom Paris. We haven't even <laughs> talked about the bulk of the episode, which involves the Doctor. Mm-hmm. Which I guess there's not really a ton to say there because he just is the Doctor in Beowulf. He just like goes about and does like his spin on what it means to be a fantasy hero. You're forgetting that you know Freya was picking up on the Doctor's raw sexual energy that was given <laughs> off. Mm-hmm. God. Before I... that, though, when they were first like asking him to like go into this into this video game for them. He looked so excited. He mm-hmm. looked like he was very like amped up and kind of like nervous energy. Yeah, but... it was mm-hmm. he could not control his face and it was very good. The thing that I thought was funny is that there he's like, "Okay, I have to do all this studying to get ready." And it's like, "You're a computer." Yeah. Pro. Can't you just like download it into your files well, much... and then you just know it? Well, I thought that's what the joke was, was going to be, that he was going to sit there for like one second and be like, okay, done. But no, he yeah. spent hours doing it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He asked the computer the, to download the Beowulf is. and then yeah. went to the computer to read it. Like, hey, you're yeah. a computer. Yeah. You, yeah. you can probably just... read really fast, yeah. maybe. The, well, the, band, the bandwidth was just really slow out in Delta Quadrant, so he was downloading <laughs> it progressively as he was reading through it. I see, I see. Yeah, he doesn't have the memory banks. Then he, he yeah, they haven't laid fiber out there yet. <laughs> he was reading too fast and the book was buffering and stuttering mm-hmm. and it was awful. Yeah, that makes sense. That would happen. Um, the doctor, the actor who plays the doctor, Robert Picardo, described this episode as Alice in Wonderland with a bald, middle-aged, cranky, arrogant Alice. <laughs> <laughs> and then, And then Alice makes out with someone is the like yeah. other thing that isn't it mm-hmm. i i was super annoyed by that i just thought it was really stupid like just let the doctor mm-hmm. be ace like he is like yeah. just let him mm-hmm. like because <laughs> it's just actually i don't know if there's more stuff like that with him with anybody else i can't remember there might be there probably is but it just felt so dumb and forced and then his line at the end when he's got the sword <laughs> Yeah. And he's like, well, okay, so they send him into the holodeck to because people, the people that they send in there just keep getting turned into energy beings and kidnapped, and they're like, you're a hologram, you that won't happen to you. Yeah, they're like, you're already energy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he goes in there after his studying and is immediately best friends with Freya. She, like, thinks he's amazing because he tells her that she's hurt, she's well known he's heard of her <laughs> so mm-hmm. she's like oh sweet and then she's immediately in love with him I guess mm-hmm. but yeah because he's heard of her I'm gonna push yeah. back <laughs> that's it a little bit here I, I I agree that it was forced and weird and fake in this episode but I think there's some interesting territory to explore with the doctor having a relationship with someone who's not a hologram mm-hmm. yeah I think like there there's definitely room that they could that they could have with that and like even asexual people will have romantic relationships, but like, you know, we'll we'll see we'll see how they play with it. Yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting. I think they're still. I mean, they've only really just started exploring like the Doctor's humanity. Mm-hmm. So I think it's still. If it does come up, I wouldn't wouldn't expect it for like a few seasons. Would be my guess. Yeah. Because well, yeah, I just thought this episode. I don't know. I mean, I guess you can explain it away by saying it's a holodeck program. Like, that's what would happen to anybody who was playing that character in that thing. And that was, like, part of the story. Uh, But the thing was, at the end, okay, so there's this other pointless character who's, like, there to just cause conflict and just Mm -hmm. is trying to thwart his plan. (laughs) The, the, The needless antagonist. Yeah, to like except fix... except that guy's actually in the poem, and that's what he actually does in it. Mm. So he kills Freya. Does that happen in the poem? Um, I don't remember. Freya is not really a character in the poem. She's only mentioned as the king's daughter. Okay, so they gave her more of a part. <laughs> yeah, I guess that makes sense that there wouldn't be any female characters in the poem. <laughs> yeah. Um, but. She like dies to save him while he's trying to save 
his uh like Tuwak and Chicote and Harry and mm-hmm. and when that was happening I was like this is so dumb she's just a hologram but then I was like he's also a hologram so maybe the feelings <laughs> were real like yeah totally so cuz in theory they could just like restart the program and she would be there again you know but I mean, would it, really... it be would she contain those memories still no. or would it be blank you know right. from the start it uh it's it touches on some of the questions that we've talked about the doctor before about like what it means to be um like what it means to be alive what it means to have a relationship what it means to be a human and not right like is is this a real relationship or is it scripted is it fake does it matter if it feels real yeah i know it's interesting because the fact that she is part of this holodeck story means at least aspects of it are scripted mhm right but I mean, that if you apply those same the same technology to her as you did the doctor, like kept this holodeck program running and gave it, you know, like if you gave him all the same conditions as the doctor has, like maybe, but I don't know. It is, it feels different to me being a holodeck character. Yeah, hologram I think, than because I think he's different. Like he is, he was created as a medical hologram with memories and stuff given to him. And like the person that made him, it's sort of a similar relationship, I think to how the person who made data, Mm -hmm. it it was like a pet project and they gave this project like way more agency than like a regular one. And Mm -hmm. maybe it's not replicable, but I'm not sure if I, I don't really remember how they expand on that, but I think they definitely do. I'm curious to see where it goes. He's such a rich character, both in terms of his like actual characterization and like who he is as, I guess, a hologram. But I am, it'll be cool to see what kind of explorations they do with this. But I mean, going back to what we were saying, like I think it if it feels real to him, then that's what matters, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> hollow holodeck hollow novels belong to their readers. <laughs> 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 So I think, yeah. I mean, that was his. That was his first experience with yeah. like anything outside of sick bay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It had to be overwhelming. Like, so no matter what actually happened or how much time he actually spent there, it was like sensory overload. Right. So everything was just going to be heightened anyway. I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why he was so into eating that elk leg when they were at the. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh huh. While he was sharing his vaccine stories. Because has he ever eaten food? No. No. Even if it's fake food and hollow. I mean, it's not. It's the food that he could eat. Mm -hmm. So now, theoretically, he could just go into the holodeck and have pizza or something if he's like, (laughs) I feel like trying to eat. I feel like eating and having that experience. Mm -hmm. I love that he was also like putting putting out all these like different medical things that he's done while he's just casually eating a giant elk leg. Chowing down. Yeah, Yeah. It was pretty pretty great uh Mm -hmm. so actor fact for this episode uh michael keenan the man who played king rothgar uh this is not his first appearance or this was his first appearance on star trek it's not his only appearance on star trek because he's also in deep space nine uh for a couple episodes of somebody named patrick but he's been in a lot of other uh just little interesting roles. He's never, it doesn't seem like he's ever really led anything except for maybe Dallas, a TV series in like the nineties. Um, but he's like on our real That's monsters. A pretty, pretty yeah, big tell, show. Tell me what you know about Dallas right now. Nothing. <laughs> I, this Texas. is obviously news to you. I know nothing. What is the <laughs> phrase who shot JR mean to you? Nothing. <laughs> It means nothing. It means I've nothing never seen you? this show or heard of this show until this moment. Okay, well, I'm from Dallas wow. originally, so I have heard of it. And my parents watched. Okay, it. Okay, well, I don't he was know on it as Keller. About it, that doesn't mean anything to me. I didn't yeah, watch it, but I know about it, and I've heard that. I've heard the Huja Jr. quote. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like one of the biggest TV shows of all time. <laughs> but who it did shoot pretty- Jr.? You, you, okay. It's like his stepbrother or something. But spoilers. Oh yeah, sorry for a thirty-year-old TV show. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, well, he was on Dallas. We're watching a pretty old TV show, and you guys don't want spoilers. We're gonna have to have a Dallas cast next. <laughs> okay, yeah. Our Grey's so Anatomy Alice- <laughs> Dallas podcast coming up on Patreon. So what? What is the statute of limitations on spoilers? I don't know. If One you're actively generation. watching it or interested in it, the and you don't want spoilers, moves. it's eternal. But yeah, the goalposts move all the time. It was a few years ago that Allison and I were watching through Cheers, an already old show, Mm -hmm. where they gave away a spoiler to the ending of Murder on the Orient Express, and Allison was livid. (laughs) Like, that (laughs) is so old! (laughs) That is so old! That's hilarious. You can't be upset about spoilers for that. (laughs) (laughs) Dallas was on from 1978 to 1991. TV show from okay, the 90s, he, says Ben. <laughs> Dude, long oh, ass show. I, I didn't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, the he was on episode, it in the 90s. Who shot, who shot JR was the inspiration for Who Shot Mr. Burns in The Simpsons. Oh. Mm, mm-hmm. Interesting. It, <laughs> that 1980 episode where they had that Who Shot JR mystery was the, is the second highest rated primetime telecast ever. <laughs> yep. Still. It was a huge deal. To this day. <laughs> yeah. Well, shows how much I know. I'm excited to introduce Ben to a little bit of history. I don't think my parents There's have f- ever talked about it either. <laughs> I, my parents have never seen it. I've never seen it. It's just one of those things you know about. Apparently Maybe, not. Did you know about it? Cultural osmosis. I I knew it by name, but I knew yeah. nothing about it. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> it's still on like his known for is in order it goes Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Voyager, Dallas, and then Picket Fences. So. Wait, okay, so what was his char- was he how many episodes of Dallas was he in? Was he like a main character? Or uh it looks like he was in five. I don't know. So I guess not a leading character. Okay. I was just looking at, I was like, this is the one that he has the most appearances on. But here's the thing you could be on three seasons of Dallas as a main character and still be forgotten by a show that was on for that long. Uh huh. Mm hmm. It's like it's like the Grey's Anatomy of. <laughs> we have to have a, 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 a yes. podcast comparing Grey's Anatomy and Dallas, but. Grizzass I veto this soon, one because we're gonna run out of episodes. Yeah, that's two hours per episode. Who see. shot Doctor Gray? <laughs> I, who knows at this point? That's probably <laughs> happened. Uh, where were we? We were talking about Voyager, I think. Yeah. Anyway, anyways, my touchstone so, for what he had been on was Ah Real Monsters. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Continuing. <laughs> uh, it's perfect capper. Okay, so basically they they found out that there's a nearby big energy planet thing where everything was just yeah, converted into pure energy and absorbed into this planet or something. Spaceship, um, yeah. So they realized, you know, what they had in one of the containers was a, a child, I guess, or something, some piece of this bigger entity and that you know, the the other crew members were essentially taken captive by this entity. So the doctor goes back in to return the the energy they captured, um, and everyone in Beowulf kind of freaks out about that. Um, particularly that antagonist guy. But one of my favorite parts of the episode was when he stands up to him and he goes, the only reason you won't die is because I've taken an oath to do no harm. That was was such a good moment. It was just like the perfect moment for the doctor. Really? I thought it was corny as hell. (laughs) It was corny, but that's why it was good. Absolutely. But for like the doctor to like go from being this like nervous wreck about, uh, going on this mission in the first place to like him having the confidence to stand up and do that super corny line Mm -hmm. (laughs) like yeah i thought it was a a good moment for him even yeah even though the line was definitely corny Mm -hmm. it was such a light episode it it fit the tone Mm -hmm. yeah so that's all i got on this one not my favorite but good doctor moments yeah it's the doctor I like mm-hmm. anything that Doctor is in, really, because 
man, he's just so good. Yes. I did have one thought at the end of this episode. What are they going to do with the doctor when they get home? Because he's not the emergency medical hologram anymore. I mean, he is, right? But he's so much more than that already. He's had these, he's had an away mission. He's had these crazy experiences. They can't just like, what, go home and leave him on the ship forever? What are they going to do with him? Don't worry about it. I mean, don't I know worry, they're going to cover it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I know they're going to cover it. Don't worry about it. She's doing. Uh, Sarah's trying so hard not to spoil this and, and be like, worried "Don't about worry." Do you want me to tell you? No. Okay, then don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was asking my co-hosts who haven't seen this show. Okay. Man, I don't know. <laughs> That's my answer. Great. They're going to throw him on a jump drive and just bring him wherever, <laughs> plug him in the nearest console. Like, hey, come on. I hope he gets a body, a real body. He has a body. A real, per- a, f- a flesh and blood body. But he can choose to be, fl- he can choose to be solid or not. That was He's a hologram. Cool. He still got his arm cut off, though. It, they, he, he got it back. All they had to do was turn him <laughs> off, turn back on again, his arm. Quick <laughs> reboot. The reset button. <laughs> Yeah. Shit, did um, we power cycle the doctor? He's missing an arm. <laughs> <laughs> the writer for this episode thought that was a fun little in-joke for people who had read Beowulf, because apparently it's quite a famous scene in that poem where Beowulf cuts off Grendel's arm. Hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, but he wasn't okay. supposed to be Grendel. Yeah, he was, just, he was Beowulf. Yes, you see, it was the inversion. That was what made it so deliciously amusing. <laughs> Should we go to Adventure Time now? I don't really have anything else to say about Star Trek for this. Well, we've think... talked about it for a long time, yeah. so uh-huh. we can move on. All right. We also watch Adventure Time episode 21, Donnie. Finn and Jake help a grass ogre named Donnie, voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, turn his life around without realizing the ecological damage they may be causing in the process. After the duo realizes that Donnie's obnoxious personality is necessary for nature, they reverse their aid. And episode 22, Henchman. Finn takes his place as Marceline's new henchman. Marceline decides to prank Finn by telling him to do tasks that seem evil, but are actually benign. In the end, Marceline and Finn become friends after Finn saves her from a vampire slaying Jake. Safety patrol. Safety patrol. <laughs> Safety We're not uniform? wearing the uniforms? <laughs> That was very good. I especially liked the detail of the costume. That was like the little mm-hmm. reflective triangles that he was wearing on his feet. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and these little house people are regular and ordinary. Uh huh. How's howsies? Uh-huh. Howsies. <laughs> so there's more vor in this episode. Did you catch it? <laughs> no. So I wasn't particularly both, looking the jail for it. Tells him to both, go in. Yeah, the, oh. the jailhouse cop going, "Good, now get in your tiny cell," which is his his belly, <laughs> as well as probably the the well. Right, that would be yeah. you know swallowing up all those yeah all those uh those wolves. I guess that's the, the why face? wolves. The well had a face. Oh, it was an old I man. I mean, it did have a face. Yeah, it was it the old man. I'd missed the that. Hole, the hole was more the top of his head, though, I guess. <laughs> no, he's, he had a head, it's head sticking out of it. It was more like a hunchback mm-hmm. where the hunch was a hole. Yeah, because right. his line was basically like, well, there's always the old well. He yells, I'm not old. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was distracted by the werewolves. Why wolves? The- well, because when I said, when I heard, we're not werewolves, my immediate thought was the swearwolves. Swear <laughs> yeah. We're werewolves, not yep. swearwolves. Yep, Taylor was... turned to me and did the exact same thing. Immediately <laughs> what came to mind. Yeah. We were then actually have talking you seen about what we do in the show. Yeah, yeah. I love okay. it. Okay. Yes. We were talking about that earlier, and we both agreed and that this is sort of a, it's, I don't want to call it smarter. It's a better level of comedy. I, I, what am I trying to say here? Swear wolves and why wolves are funny for this the, for the same reason, and I like it. And I feel like Adventure Time is just taking little baby steps into getting a little bit smarter with its humor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. But it's, then it also has there. still has things where it has you know the grass ogre having a little leaf to cover up his old grass dingus. <laughs> <laughs> I loved empathy, that once. Empathy. Put yourself in place of me. 
That's a good one. Now that I have a, a one year old, I'm, I'm going to uh-huh. start teaching her that when she's a little bit older. Can we start mm-hmm. teaching that to the Donnie in the White House? Well, <laughs> if only. Uh, uh. <laughs> I thought he kind of looked like him, even with his hair, like his like leaf hair, I mean, and, yeah. like that weird. Mm-hmm. It can't be unseen now. <laughs> no, it can't. Uh, you've sapped all strength from me. <laughs> <laughs> Donald, quit all this jerky nonsense. Uh... I'm sure. <laughs> Great. Now, which now one of us needs to tweet a picture of D- of Donnie at Donald every time he tweets. <laughs> just, he set up a bot to do it. Up, just, yeah, I was just gonna say. That. I just wanted to talk about why wolves. <laughs> we can still talk about that. <sighs> Andrew, please tell us about why wolves. Creatures possessed by the spirit of inquiry. Just give Andrew a minute to go spackle his cracks. <laughs> <laughs> I liked this episode. Uh, I remember fun. not liking it, and then when it came on, I liked it, and then we got to the Y Wolves. I was like, hell yeah, I'm on board with this ridiculous show. <laughs> <laughs> I loved his little pipe that was like a uh, a beaker in a holder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And his lab coat and his glasses, and they're just like totally happy with overpopulating and then dying out. It's fine. It'll be fun. It'll be fun in the process. The Cosmic Owl. Which makes me think of the owl from Avatar The Last Airbender, which basically destroys an entire library because fuck you, that's why. (laughs) I liked the part where the chickens were rental chickens. Uh (laughs) And Donnie's using them as uh, as egg cannons. Mm -hmm. Egg cannons. Yep, and just at the end when he goes back to being a jerk, he just, you know... Has has them just cradled in both armpits and just repeatedly <laughs> squeeze squeeze, squeeze yeah. eggs out of them, mm-hmm. giving off all that obnoxygen, mm-hmm. a deadly poison for why wolves. I think I'm realizing that part of the reason why I like this episode so much is because of all the good pun work. <laughs> yeah, there is quite a bit in this one. Yeah, did we? And I think this was also Bimo's first line. In the yeah. Film. Oh yeah. Because he, every other like, time Bimo's been in it, he, inanimate. he Donnie breaks the controller or something, right? Yeah, yeah, breaks the controller and goes, I'm incapable of this all emotions, <laughs> but you're making me chafed. So that becomes a more, yes, like an actual character, yeah. yes, mm-hmm. yes. Bimo is voiced by, oh, sorry, Nikki Yang, the same um, person who does uh, Princess Rainicorn. Yep, okay. and she's a storyboard artist uh, for Adventure Time. Uh, I want to say she also r- like wrote this episode as well. It's possible. Uh, yeah, Bimo shows up a lot, um, and Bimo gets very weird very quickly in a mm. way that I find quite charming. That's good. That seems good. There's a great episode later where you see Bimo's strange split personality. Mm. It's a little dark and upsetting, but but very good. I love Bimo. Speaking of dark and upsetting, Marceline's back. I love, I love Marceline. I love uh-huh. Rock. She Marceline. Is so, <laughs> I loved so good. this episode. It was such I wrote a good on, I think this is my favorite episode. I mean, she's a radical so dame who likes to play games. She's the best. <laughs> I yeah, knew Marceline you would like rocks. her a lot, but that first episode mm-hmm. she appeared in was not a strong suit for her. Like her being mm-hmm. her being this like troll that's just like messing with people because she can is great. Mm-hmm. Well, see, I didn't even see it like that because to me, it, she's going around doing good the way that she feels like doing it and doesn't give mm-hmm. a fuck how other people see it or think about her. Mm-hmm. And in the end, like, I wasn't totally sure if this was intentional, but it seemed like they were like staging that whole thing. So that Jake could overcome his fear. <laughs> oh, and interesting. Feel like he did something helpful. And then she was like, then she just like escaped and was like, bye, see you later. <laughs> you know, yeah. she's this like, isn't like, fun anymore. Bye. <laughs> like, let him think that he killed me. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I'll just mess with him later. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, don't know. I think, I think you were right. No, she was definitely doing what the good the way that she wanted to. But she was also having some fun with uh, by messing with Finn the entire time, just yeah. like trying to make it seem like she was being super evil to just to uh, just to Finn. 
Yeah. Which which I mean, was that fun. guy really really wanted a white tie. <laughs> look, look what did you, did you think it looked kind of looks so like nice. a bra? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do now. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as the one person here who wears a bra. <laughs> I, know, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, maybe you guys have seen different types of bras than me. I don't know. But like that, it looked like a big tie. But then <laughs> like I also thought. Tie. Hold on. How many different types of bras are there? Not I mean, that there's the many, normal okay. ones, and well, there's really that big get fanciful into this, Andrew, one in this episode. Really? There's the normal kind, and then there's the yeah. kind that I guess look like giant bow ties. I don't know. <laughs> right, apparently. The big, fancy, <laughs> fanciful, fancy lad ones. <laughs> I do love wearing my fancy lad. <laughs> <laughs> I really <laughs> loved the zombies waking up, going like, hey, what's up? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Hey. It was a fun episode. It was. I really enjoyed Jake's mm-hmm. slow descent into total madness and how afraid he was of her. <laughs> Scares the yeah. filling out of my donut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's this great little bit where he's very afraid and he makes his own barrel to hide in. Just his face. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just like turning himself inside out almost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And his very good strawberry disguise at the end. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was legitimately freaked out for a minute when I thought that she'd actually been killed. They wouldn't have done that. Yeah, so I didn't. Early. Really, I didn't really know what was going on there. But then she like moved and hid under the umbrella again, and was yeah. fine. So then I was like, okay, because <laughs> I, I couldn't tell if that was real or like right another troll by her. Yeah, but that was a. Very interesting line where she talked about being the sun, and she's like, "Yeah, it hurts, but I kind of like it. Like it reminds me of when I would like skin my knee, and then like my parents would take care of me or whatever." She said, "I was like, that is a line that I w- was not expecting out of this episode." Yeah, yeah, that kind yeah. of like introspectiveness mm-hmm. of you know pain i don't know it was just a it's again a a kind of a hint of a hint of kind of the 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 route that the show kind of goes Mm -hmm. later but i don't know it's nice seeing some of these nuggets of substance in the episodes yeah it's a really interesting point about the route the show takes later because they do sort of take these lighter cartoon concepts and find the more like realistic or darker underbelly that goes along with it all. Mm -hmm. Especially like Marceline's a great, a great example of that kind of thing. Cause like it, that line implies that she remembers what all of her life or all of her life from before she was a vampire. And that like, it's been so long since she's been, since she was turned that she like is looking for anything to kind of make her feel a little bit like she was, like mm-hmm. she did before she kind of grasping onto like, those few memories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's a it's a nice little thing that they like casually throw in that kind of gives her a little bit of a sadder backstory than right. Uh, well, it says so yeah. much in one line. Mm-hmm. Like that was not a necessary right. line for the episode to make sense, but it like in one in one sentence gives such dimension to her. I don't know. This That's is the really real strength really of the, yeah, the real strength of Adventure Time and board-driven TV in general. So before, a lot of kids' cartoons were scripted, and then the scripts would be sent to production. This one is where the animator themselves are writing it directly into the storyboards, mm-hmm. and it just gives you. We talked about this in an earlier episode with um, the Ice King and his bag of trail mix, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it just gives you these little moments to breathe and. Things that would get cut in a script for time or not being directly related to the story because it's an animator doing it on their own can exist in these scripts and they mm-hmm. really capitalize on that. Yeah, absolutely. It also is a good, like, it's also a nice comparison between this and Star Trek because, like, they're, they're really milking every line in Adventure Time for what it, what it can be worth when it's, like, something important like that. 
Like they make that line so valuable to like who Marceline is. Whereas you can get like an entire episode that Star Trek is like writing in maybe one thing of development or nothing. So because they, they have more, they have more volume to work with. They have more time to actually be able to do something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Connections. I'm quite excited to share mine. Hit it with hit us with it, uh, Nate. Finn violated the Prime Directive. Whoa! He went into a civilization and disrupted the natural order and shifted the power, leading to inevitable <laughs> mass extinction due to the cosmic owl. Yep. Whoa! Holy shit! <laughs> That's a really good one. I was pretty excited about that one. Wow. <laughs> Damn son. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really have one. They they were in Bale Wolf and there's wolves in the adventure. <laughs> Finn has a sword and they had swords in <laughs> in Beowulf. I got nothing for this one, uh but I don't think we need to after Nate pulls that one out there. That's incredible. Yeah, Nate, yeah, yeah. Nate hit that one out of the park. Well, I think we knocked this one out of the park, too. Fault, remember to rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, follow us on social media, at Voyager Time, wherever it is, and send us in questions or anything to VoyagerTime at gmail.com. And mostly just tell anyone about the show, because like that's going to be... The only way they we're not we're not marketing or anything. We're like so word of mouth is literally like the only way that mm-hmm. you know we you know have the opportunity to grow the podcast. So just aside from anything else, even if you just you know recommend it to a friend, say you know it's a very hey, niche taste. This. We get Which, that. Yeah, I know. But I know if you can think of anyone that might find this crossover interesting, like we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just let them know. Join us next time as we watch Star Trek Voyager episode 12, Cathexis, and I really mean it this time, and the Adventure Time episode 23, Rainy Day Daydream, and 24, What Have You Done? In the meantime, we'll just wait for you here. By the mausoleum. With our backs turned. And our defenses lowered. Come along. Come along with me